you to the organizers for having me. I want to talk to you today about sort of two things, and one is about kind of, uh, well, basically best practices for all sorts of new types of technology. But I also want to talk about some of the attitudes in InfoSec and how maybe we could make things a little funner, a little better, and a little happier. So first of all, we're going to talk about red team, which is offensive security. We're going to talk slightly about blue team, which is defensive security. And then we're going to talk about purple team, which is what I consider to be collaborative security. Very briefly, I want to mention so quite often, I um, when I tell people what I do for a living, they think of this dude. <laughs> they think of like criminal, dangerous, or like, well, this person's so like cool. And but that's not what I see when I think of infosec professionals or ethical hackers or any of us. I see this. I see us as protecting and helping others. I see our profession as noble. I see us as. Even if we're doing offensive security, we're all working towards the same goal, which is to protect our organizations, our citizens, our community members, like everyone from malicious actors. And I wanna see more of this. So briefly, who am I? So I'm the Director of Developer Relations and Community at Bright Security. And I've been doing security stuff for quite a while now and doing tech for a lot longer. I wrote a book. But the main takeaway from this slide is hopefully Tanya seems competent enough that I will sit through the rest of this presentation and humor her. So enough about me, let's talk about purple team and modern approaches for application security. So the first one, we're gonna talk about collaboration, empathy and advocacy very, very quickly. Then this will be the meat of the entire project or um, presentation, which is security tactics for modern applications, then basically we automate boring things and we continue to learn so that we can continue to be awesome. So first some definition, actually, um, sorry, no, we don't really need to do definitions. I want to talk about what purple team is. So we know blue team are defenders and they do all the things to make sure that our organizations are safe. And we know red teamers test those defenses. They do offensive security. And I don't mean they swear at everyone. <laughs> I mean that they test the defenses, they push the limits, they make sure that the things are tough and rugged like we think they are. But purple team is in the middle. So I think of application security as sort of the center of the devs and the security folks. And so some people say it's red team plus blue team. But I like to think of us as the glue that holds those things together. We collaborate, we, co uh, we coordinate, we cooperate, we communicate, we teach, we provide tools, we enable. This is what AppSec people do. And so sometimes people call us the bridge between security and the software developers. So what do we do? We consult. With software developers we offer them assistance guidance enablement like whatever we can do to make them do their jobs more securely that's what we try to do we give them tools sometimes we even create our own tools we write document that documentation that people can actually understand and we advocate for security and for the software developers i just want to say that again because we do we have to look at both sides of the equation if we want to do a good job. So we advocate for both sides. So just to be clear, I feel that purple team, the idea of having a person on the security team, but that is, or a few people that are dedicated to helping the software engineers make safer apps, that is a modern approach to application security. And so when I say advocacy, what I mean is specifically us showing support for both sides. I mean, us coordinating or negotiating and quite a lot of the time trying to persuade a place in the middle where those teams can meet. So it's like you have 100 vulnerabilities. The security team wants you to fix 100 vulnerabilities. The dev teams are like, we have a deadline Friday. We would like to fix none. And that AppSec person tries to find a place in the middle where we can meet where the organization is at an acceptable risk level, but where we also haven't crushed the software developers into a corner that they can't get out of. So we try to meet in the middle of those things. 
And to do this, we need a heck of a lot of this empathy. Um, so it turns out the soft skills are actually just life skills and not everyone is good at them. And in my opinion, it's really hard to do a really good job of application security and of being a purple teamer, this person that brings everyone together, the glue, unless we have empathy. And so I, I've heard, so as I've like learned more and more and I've talked to people and I have a podcast and I interview people and I ask them and like every single person on the podcast is like, oh yeah, you can't be good at security if you don't have any empathy. You'll be that person that no one wants to deal with because you never can see the other person's point of view. And so if you learn one thing from this presentation, it is that. Um, lastly, I feel like our industry has an obsession with hackers and I'm really sorry, um, I don't know why this slide has very little contrast. So it says idols and then our obsession with hackers. If you are having trouble seeing what it says, I apologize. I'm not sure why the color, that's uh, supposed to be white. I'm not sure what changed, but basically I think that we're obsessed with hackers as an industry and as like the media, etc. because if you look at how many movies, TV shows, like, and they just like type a few lines and then, oh, we've just hacked into the RSA or, or the NSA and we've stolen a million dollars. We've done this and they make it look so easy. But I feel our obsession with hackers, I feel we do have one because there are not this many movies about accountants, trust me. But what this is leading to is sort of an obsession with red team instead of an obsession with just doing better security and all of us doing better. I feel like, when I, so like I'm, it's leading to a lot of security models that are just not affordable, where people just pen test everything and they don't do all the other amazing steps that are equally important to ensuring your software is secure. It's a really expensive model to wait until the very end and look at security finally then and hire an external resource who's an expert to come in and tell you all the things you did wrong. We could have fixed many of those things way before. And so because we're obsessed with hackers, a lot of people are like, well, the only thing we can do is hire a pen tester. No, there's a, a trillion things you can do other than just that. It's not the only important thing. Another thing is, is that our idolization of hackers, I feel is damaging our industry. I run this thing on Twitter every Monday called Cyber Mentoring Monday, where I help people find professional mentors. And for the first year, almost two years, every single person would just say, I want to be a pen tester. And that's what I did when I started. I said, I wanted to be a pen tester because I didn't know about all the other jobs. <laughs> and so it's really important that we make all of the jobs seem interesting and cool. And more importantly, that we really, really need people doing those jobs. We don't only need pen testers. We also need people that do incident response, people that do forensics, people that do reverse engineering, people that do governance, people that manage our risk, people that do threat modeling, like all those jobs, we need all of them, not just Mr. Robot. Also, I hate it when people are like, are you like Mr. Robot at work? No. <laughs> so, my little ranch is over and now I want to talk to you about modern approaches to application security. So what the purple team does every day. So I'm going to give you some best practices for some more newer types of applications. And then I'm going to give you some free resources and then we're going to wrap up. So zero trust. So this is more rather than a technology. This is more of a concept that we're trying to push forward as an industry because then we have less security problems. So what we used to do is we had implied trust. So we'd have a giant firewall, this huge perimeter that we would protect. But if you were inside, we're like, that person's probably cool. Let's let them have access to everything. And what we've discovered is it turns out that not 100% of the people in our perimeter are trustworthy. Turns out they're, or someone will be able to somehow sneak by and then they're like, this is awesome. I can get everything. So instead zero trust means only opening things up if you need to, to get the job done. It's similar to least privilege, but not quite. So within your application, you can have zero trust. Like you can have basically areas that are just aren't open unless they need to be. Between your applications, you can form zero trust. So this API can only be called by this one app because it's the only one that should be calling it. And so by default, it blocks everyone else. In your configuration, the way you design your network, all of those things, if you apply this concept, will be significantly safer. And the thing that goes hand in hand with that is assume breach. 
So that means in every aspect of IT, we assume that one day we will be, or we already have been breached at some point. And so we don't just protect the perimeter. We don't assume that we're safe. Instead, what we do is we assume breach. So let's say someone submits, um, uh, they submit a, a really critical bug to our bug bounty program or our responsible disclosure program. And we're like, oh gosh, that's terrifying. We go and look and see if it's already been exploited by a malicious actor because that person that reported it, they might be the first person to find it, but they could be the 12th person to find it. And so we spin up our instant response process. We go investigate and we see, is this a, like, has this happened before or not? And so we're assuming that we might have been breached. And so when we do that with the way we react to things, first of all, we find problems way faster. And second of all, we reduce the damage of those situations greatly. Okay, so now serverless and cloud workflows. So serverless are kind of small applications or scripts that run without a constant server being dedicated to them. So when it is triggered and needs to run, it opens up, a, it, like it boots up a container, it boots itself up, it runs to completion, and then it self-destructs, releasing the container, destroying it or shutting it down such that all those resources are released back into our cloud instance. And that means we pay for a lot less time. And then a cloud workflow are scripts that run when certain specific things happen in the cloud. So you're like, if you see this Azure or GCP or um, AWS, I want you to do that. And it's a script or activities or it calls a serverless app and so this could be if you see something that looks like SQL injection, I want you to black hole that IP or turn that down or call Tanya and tell her there's a problem. She needs to come running. And so these two types of technologies are new and only available in the clouds. But we still have to follow all the same application security best practices we would. So we still need to do monitoring and logging of these. We still need to do all the same secure coding that we used to do. And we still need to do, we still need to secure and, and secure our data in transit and at rest. But here's the best practice. So on top of this, if we are going to do serverless and use cloud workflows, we need to employ an API gateway in front of those serverless apps as a security buffer. So you can't call my serverless app from the internet. You have to go through the gateway and prove that you're you and that you do have permission to use it, and then you can call it. We want to monitor and log these things, like I said before, but ideally, we'd like to feed this information into the security information and event management system, also known as a SIM, so that the SOC, the Security Operations Center folks, can see it and actually do something about it. Even though serverless apps are tiny and they only run periodically, we still have to make sure that they're safe. Um, this, I'm just saying, like, so manage secrets in a secret management tool. We still have to do that for all apps. It's not special for serverless, but people forget sometimes. And I see the secret inside the code, and that's why I'm mentioning it. Um, and then the last two are special just for serverless and API things, APIs and serverless. So I got this from the sneak best practices, um, number four and number five. So thank you to them and their awesome DevRel team, Lyrum, that means you. Um, so they deploy functions in minimal granularity. So that means each serverless app should just do one thing. It shouldn't do 27 things. If you have to call your, like if your serverless app is running more than half the time, it's not a serverless app, it's a regular app. <laughs> um, so server, serverless app should be really tiny. and. It says isolated function perimeters, but what they mean by that is that, so let's say, so this is a thing that pen testers see a lot. So you'll have an app and it calls an API and that API calls a serverless function. And between, so the app will be very secure and maybe there'll be you know authorization and authentication when it goes to call the API, but then the API to the serverless app, for some reason, there's no authentication or authorization. So anyone that is inside the network can try to call that serverless app. And for some reason, because it's two layers from the front end, they're like, oh, I'm sure it's fine. It's not fine. Please do the same security you would for anything on your network. Don't do less because it's serverless. Okay, so next one. 
online storage, so uh, also known as the crown jewels. So all of your data, so your data for a lot of organizations is really, really, really valuable and important, and um, we need to protect it accordingly. So we want to lock it down by default. So if you're using Azure, like one of the big cloud providers, you can create templates for your organization that are automatically locked down. And then you can say anyone that creates a storage container, it has to use this template. I remember I worked at Microsoft and I made one and I had to undo six security features so that I could make it public because they really, really, really don't want to be the joke of the town like the S3 open buckets were for a very long time. So you can create templates that are safe by default. You need to classify and label your data. So classification means, is this public, like unclassified? Is this some sort of secret, i.e. classified, like people shouldn't know? Is it something above that? Is it top secret? Is it truly important? In the Canadian government, we use protected A, B, and C, and then um, like protected, secret, and top secret to decide just how much protection it needs. And then you need to label it so that everyone knows, oh, that storage container, that's top secret. I gotta do the app. I mean, I wouldn't put top secret in the cloud. Let's just be clear. But let's say it was secret and you're putting it in the cloud because you are a risk taker. Um, but basically you wanna classify and label it so everyone knows. You wanna turn on monitoring. So are people, are people going in that container? Because humans shouldn't be using storage containers. You want to check the file integrity. Has someone changed the files? You want to monitor is someone do, like sniffing your reports or doing any sort of thing that they should not be doing. So ideally you monitor this and then you have an alert go out if something happens that should not happen. And you can use a, a cloud workflow to even respond to that. So whenever I would do a security incident, I'm like, is this something that I could make the cloud detect for me? And if it does, can I create some sort of automated response? And even if the automated response is just texting me over and over again until I log in and telling me like, it's an emergency. That's better than finding out three weeks from now that something bad has happened. And lastly, storage accounts aren't for human beings. They are for computers generally. So we should only use a service account rather than a human beings account. So I have an identity on the network, but if there is an app and this app has a bunch of stuff stored in a storage container, that app has a service account. Is an identity on your network and only that account should be accessing your storage account if a human being is going in there it's like what is she doing why is she in there i need to know about this so ideally use service accounts containers and orchestration so first of all the first thing you need to do is follow the same good security and network best practices that you would so if you normally put things in zones, you should do zoning. If you normally um, scan everything once a week on-prem, you should scan everything once a week in the cloud. All the things that you would normally do to defend these, like to defend your network, you should do that to your containers and your orchestration. But on top of that, there is more. So there are new configuration rules and you need to learn those. And there's new tools that do the scanning or verification you need to learn those as well. Because there's new, because they're new, that means there's new types of vulnerabilities that you need to watch out for. Ideally, you would sign up for some sort of threat intelligence feed. So basically emails that you receive that says, watch out for this, this is happening now. And then you can go and make sure you're okay. You want to protect who can create or edit containers. This is super important. You, it's very, very, very important. I have seen mistakes where people let everyone edit or create containers and then there are huge cloud bills or way worse. So it's very important you protect who has the power for that. But a similar approach applies. So you wanna scan all that can be scanned. You wanna check your configurations, make sure. So I say patch regularly. If you're doing containers, there's sort of two votes that you can be in. And one is that you patch the container and you treat it like a pet and you keep adding to it and taking good care of it like you would a virtual machine. But there is another camp or boat called immutable infrastructure. And that is where instead of updating and patching this one, you would make a new one, update, patch, test, make sure it's perfect, and then you swap them out. And so you never actually update it. You create a brand new one that is what you want and then swap after you've tested and you make sure it's okay. So whichever one you're doing, do that. 
and then applying zero trust whenever possible. So why would you open up all 65,000 ports? Don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> Instead, only open the ones you need. So there's a few more. Do not run as root, please. I know that every time we do a workshop, we run as root, but in real life, we're not all root. Um, don't do that in production. It's a bad idea. Whenever possible, limit resources. So set quotas. And then if it reaches that stop and then have to have a human approve more, this is a way that you can avoid a catastrophic cloud bill. Um, so setting resource quotas really can help. Turn multi-factor authentication, multi-factor authentication on for all management accounts. So if it can buy stuff or manage stuff, it should have MFA turned on. This is such a fantastic good defense and it'll take you four extra seconds to log in each time and it is worth it. Secure your container registries. So don't let anyone touch those. Those are only for you and the team managing them. And lastly, do not download or use untrusted containers. So do not go to Docker Hub and just download random things. This is definitely the danger zone. You do not want to do, please don't do this. <laughs> please don't do this. Whenever possible, please don't do this. Okay, so now APIs and microservices. So an API is, a web API is basically a web app with no front end. It's, it provides services to you on the internet. A microservice means an API that's teeny tiny that just does one thing. Whether you decide to make teeny tiny APIs and call them microservices or create bigger APIs and you have your GUI, your front end, call all of those things, whichever you desire, it's fine. But you still need to follow, the, I feel like a broken record, the same AppSec best practices you would. You still need to do dynamic scanning. You still need to make sure your dependencies are safe. You still need to do static application security testing or some sort of code review to make sure that really obvious mistakes haven't been made. You still need to do all the things that you would normally do for a web app, except for the front end stuff. So that's very small amount of stuff because most of the cool actions always on the back end. So all the stuff you would normally do plus Wait, wait, there's the sun plus. If you have many, many, many microservices and APIs, you should consider getting a service mesh. The service mesh is a bit like orchestration for containers. So when you do a microservice architecture, you have hundreds of uh, microservices and thousands and thousands and thousands of calls. TCP IP was not designed for this. So what a service mesh does is it manages everything end to end. It encrypts everything end to end and it speeds everything up and make sure that none of your APIs accidentally go boink and collide and then they don't arrive. And so a service mesh, if you have a lot of stuff, is very important. If you just have like five APIs that called like get called four times a day, you're fine. You don't need that. It's for when you're quite serious and you're using quite a few. You want to have standardization and templates for your organization. So you should have a secure coding standard or guideline but you should have specifics for APIs of what you expect. Like everyone should be using the OPA, um, Open API Standard 3.0, let's say. No one should be using old Swagger files anymore. No one should be using SOAP. What are you doing? Any of those things, and then everyone needs to follow it. You need to, you need to lint your API definition file and ensure that it, that it is complete and then you need to lint like the way that you call your API as well. So your definition file needs to be linted and then the code of your APIs need to be linted, like the calls that you're making. It is very, very important that it is complete. Um, if you haven't defined like a maximum or a minimum or the format or the characters you're willing to accept or how big or small the date field can be, if you don't do those things, then your API doesn't have input validation. And then it's just, it's a sitting duck on the internet. It's very important. Ideally, your API should be behind a, an API gateway, which I think is later on the screen. Um, it should be behind an API gateway if it's on the internet. And you should use the features of throttling and resource quotas. So that will protect your API from bots. So throttling means slowly slowing it down. And then resource quota means you've called me 50 times. You're done, buddy. Go away, come back tomorrow. I know what you're doing. This is not cool. This will protect you from giant cloud bills. It will protect you from denial of service attacks. It will protect non-distributed denial of service attacks, et cetera. So 
that is really important. If you are going to not use an API gateway, you must still authenticate and authorize and you must do it in that order. So authentication, who are you? And authorization, should you even be here? It's really important that you do it in that order if you're gonna write your own, but ideally, again, you use an API gateway and then it takes care of this for you. Lastly, hide what you can, don't share extra info. If you're going to give an error message from an API, it is a computer receiving that error message. Don't write them a long story about exactly what they did wrong. Like, oh, we don't accept singled quotes. So you need to format your thing. Don't give them hints. Just be like, bad input, try again. You're not gonna hurt their feelings because it is a computer getting this response. Unless it's a pen tester, a malicious actor, or it is while it is currently in development, there's no human receiving those error message. So don't make them verbose. And lastly, only enable the HTTP methods or verbs that you are using and then block or disable the rest. So if you are on like a, a VM, let's say, and you're running your APIs from there, a web server will run head, trace, delete, um, post, put, get, etc. all sorts of HTTP methods. But most APIs only use delete, get, and post. It's very rare you use other ones, so disable the rest. Because when I'm going to attack your app, what I'm going to do is try to do every single type of method to see what I can get. So don't let them get anything. Turn that off. So next is a list of modern tooling. So I'm going to list a bunch of modern application security tooling. And then we are going to go on to the next section because we have limited time. Honestly, I would talk to you forever, <laughs> but no one probably wants that. So here are some modern or newer types of application security toolings that you might not have heard of. So I asked interactive application security testing. So this is a binary that goes inside your application, which means only certain types of apps or like frameworks and programming languages are supported. It goes inside your app and it tests as your application is being used. And so it can find different types of vulnerabilities than perhaps a SAS could or a DAST could, but it needs to be tested. You need to use it a lot or it's not gonna be able to do good tests. So it's a different way of doing security testing. RASP, which stands for Runtime Application Security Protection. This is also a binary that goes inside your application, but what it does is it looks at the input to your app and the output from your app and it, and, and it tries to block bad requests. And so it's a bit like a WAF, a web application firewall. It is a shield for your application. So it tries to stop bad um, input and stop bad output to protect your application. And it's part of your app because it's a binary that's inside. And so it has, I believe, better latency than a WAF, but I let the vendors duke that out. File integrity monitoring and application control tooling. Ignore the last one. Um, so file integrity monitoring, sometimes called FIM, and application control tooling, also previously known as application waitlisting, work together hand in hand. So I remember doing this at Microsoft and seeing good results. So basically FIM checks that all your system files don't get changed. It's like those shouldn't be changed. Certain things just should not change. If something tries to change them, it stops them. And then application control tooling is a list, like an approved list of what is allowed to run on that machine. And so if you get malware or you get attacked somehow, the first thing malware tries to do is boot itself up and then it's not on the approved list. So the application control tooling just like stomp. And then it's like, I know what I'll do. I'll rename myself to a system file because I know those are on the approved list. It's like, I'll just read it and then FIM comes out of nowhere and stomps on it again and says, no, I don't think so, buddy. And so it's a very, it's, it requires effort to maintain and make it good, but it is very good for stopping malware on your machines. Uh, when I was at one company, we sent a thing away for analysis because we thought we had a big problem and it turned out there was malware sitting on there dormant because it couldn't work because of our FIM and our application control tooling. And I was like, yes, in your face. Just kidding, don't taunt hackers. Um, so the second last one, or the one that is at the bottom, cloud native control tools. When you buy cloud, 
your subscription is paying for all sorts of security tools out of the box from different vendors. Use them. You're already paying for them. Take advantage. Literally, that's my whole message with that one. Just look at everything included in your subscription and use every single free thing you can because they're really, really good and they're free. You're already paying for them. Um, add security tools to your DevOps pipeline. So this is called DevSecOps. There's certain tools that are literally made for CI CD pipelines. You should check them out. I'm not going to make a list because we will be here all day, but there are newer tools that are just for that and they're really cool. And so um, check that out. Oh, we already talked about customizing alerts and creating automated responses, but the last one is application inventory tools. So there's a bunch of companies coming out with systems that will be able to find all of your web assets, including all of your custom apps and all your APIs. I think that's awesome. I have not seen that, um, like that just sort of started in 2020, but it's getting really good in 2022. And so if you are doing an application inventory exercise, there are now tools that can actually do a really decent job. So with that, this is a summary of the types of modern applications and activities that are and tooling that you can do. If you were going to take a screenshot of a slide, this is a slide that I would definitely look at because, uh, or that I would take a photo of if I could. So I feel like I've talked enough to given you the chance to take the screenshot that you want to take. So I'm going to go to the next slide because I know I only have so much time. So the next thing you want to do is automate the boring stuff. So we want to avoid manual errors. We want to avoid our staff getting super bored and leaving to go work somewhere else. And we want to avoid toil. Toil is work that is that you constantly have to repeat. that doesn't have long term value that could definitely be automated. That is toil. We are better than toil. That's why we work in IT. We want to make everything faster. We want to make no more manual mistakes. We want to do the cool work, not the boring work. And so we do automation. So first of all, use pipelines, do DevOps, release your code that way. You can have a second pipeline that just does intense security testing. So you don't have to release code with every pipeline. You don't have to go to different environments. You can do a whole bunch of testing automatically with a CI CD and never publish the code anywhere and therefore not interrupt the nice DevOps folks who are trying to release stuff. And then you can just get all of your reports together and figure out what you actually want to action. Um, SecOps, so you can do infrastructure as code and security as code. So you do infrastructure as code, meaning you create configuration code files that tells the DevOps pipeline what to create for you. And then security as code is writing the security right into there. And then you can actually scan the infrastructure as code after that to make sure it's obeying all of your security policies. Like it's so cool, all the things that we can automate if we take the time and invest to do it. So then we can be proactive. Instead of just constantly responding to security incidents or fires, we can work to prevent security incidents. We can upgrade our security features so they're better and tougher. We spend less time cleaning up messes. And so I joke that the slogan for DevOps should be less toil, more triumph, because we don't want to do boring work anymore. We're intelligent human beings. You cannot be a not intelligent human and work in InfoSec, you just won't make it. So if you're here, you're smart. And so let's do more interesting work by spending the time and investing in automation so that we can do super cool stuff. And also even the act of automating is super fun and interesting. And the last part is continuous learning. And so I'm gonna talk briefly about how you can continue to learn. And that is a part of working in any area of InfoSec, but especially application security. So how do we do continuous learning? So first of all, the moment we stop prioritizing learning, we fall behind. This is why it's part of DevOps. It's part of the three ways of DevOps. It's like you're not doing DevOps right if you're not continuing to try to learn because you will fall behind. We InfoSec people can make every single moment a teaching moment, whether it's good or it's bad. So if you find a new cool bug that you've never found before because you looked in a new way, tell the rest of your team that's in charge of finding bugs. If you fixed a bug and it was really hard, but you're like, I finally fixed it, tell your whole team how you fixed it. Sharing these little mini lessons 
is better for everyone. And it tends to create a more positive environment around sharing information. So then people are more likely to share information back with you. Micro lessons. So it's, these are all sorts of different options for learning. So you could have a lunch and learn, you could do computer-based training. You can make these little mini lessons. You can send emails out with what you've learned. It's not specifically having to be done a certain way. It's just that you need to make sure you are doing something. De developers and operations folks are constantly bringing in new technology and we security folks, we can't stop them. So we have to adapt because otherwise they'll go around us. And spoiler alert, lots of them are probably going around us right now. And so it's really important that we remain open and tell them we want to learn about what we're doing and we don't yell at them, please don't do that. Um, other ways to learn. So I have with my teams before created calendar learning blocks so that they can self train and continue to learn job shadowing, mentoring on the lob, on the job learning. All of those things are ways that we can teach our staff and ourselves sharing info with other teams. So like whether we win or we lose, these are things that are valuable to share. I really enjoy finding metrics about like what mistakes we're making the most often and then creating lessons around that. And then watching the instances of that happen go way down. You can build your own training that's specific to your organization. Um, and I find that really helpful. Um, so I have a, a brief story about the time that I invented DevOps. So spoiler, I did not invent DevOps, but I wish I did. Um, I The first time I spoke at RSA, um, which is a big conference in California that I'm speaking at next week. One of my friends called me a week later and I had spoken about DevOps and DevSecOps and she's like, yeah, the senior tech, he hadn't been on training in 10 years and he saw your talk and he thinks you're a god now. He thinks you invented DevOps because he'd never heard of it ever before. And she's like, how could our senior tech never have heard of DevOps? And that was like 2018. That was not that long ago. And so don't be that guy or gal or person who has never heard of really important things because you haven't taken the time to improve yourself. You are valuable. Please take the time to continuously learn so that you can continue to do the more interesting, cool, fun work and do a better job of protecting your organization. And so I have a brief rant in my conclusion. I am wicked tired of everyone thinking of this guy when they think of our industry. This is what a hacker looks like. This is a person I know named Steph. She um, is she is a hacker. And that's what hackers can look like. Hackers can look like me or you. Like, look in the mirror. That's what a hacker looks like. I want us to stop thinking about a dude in his parents' basement in the dark for some reason, wearing a black hoodie, and then that person being a hacker. We can look like anyone. And it's really, really important that we stop having these stereotypes because it's preventing lots of people from joining our industry. Honestly, when people were like, you should become an ethical hacker, you'd be good at this. I'm like, I'm not like Mr. Robot, what are you talking about? I am a nice dev and I build stuff and make my customers happy. That's what I do. And then it turned out, I can actually make my customers really happy by protecting them. And so this is what a hacker looks like. A hacker looks like everyone, look in the mirror, that's what it looks like. We need to break these stereotypes. And secondly, second part of my rant, please be nice to developers. Don't tell them your code's crappy. That hurts. <laughs> They're doing the best they can. Help them do better. They are our friends and every single team and IT are our allies. And when we talk down to them, they, they don't want to work with us. When we act like, oh, you guys are so dumb, you should know this. They don't want to work with us. We need to, as an industry, be more open and be nicer to the other teams. I want to break this stereotype that we're like, oh, all the other teams are so dumb. They don't know about security. Yeah, well, I don't know everything about ops because that's not my job. And so I've seen this attitude at so many different places I've worked. And so if you just be nice to a dev, please. <laughs> okay, that's the end of my rant. And now I'm going to give you a bunch of resources. So first resource, I have a podcast. And in it, we teach little mini lessons. So season two are very short episodes. Season one were very long episodes. Season two is about uh, different, just little tiny mini lessons about security. And season one was about all the different types of jobs and careers that you could have within information security. You can download us on any, any podcast platform or go to YouTube and actually watch the interviews. 
awesome books. So the first four books are about DevOps. And I believe you can't do security right if you are not doing IT right. And for me, for software development, the best way is DevOps. And then my book, Alice and Bob Learn Application Security. Next, I work at Bright. Bright bought my company. I am very pleased about this. They have an awesome blog and I write some of the articles on there, but just all of us write articles. There's lots of technical advice. And if you have a security problem you're trying to fix in your code, we have a zillion articles about that. Join the WeHack Purple community. So when Bright bought the WeHack Purple community, we took all of the academy courses that you used to pay lots and lots of money for and made them free. So join the WeHack Purple community, come to our fun live streams, read our articles, take our courses, and join a group of people who are actually really nice and all want to help each other learn. Every Monday on Twitter, I do Cyber Mentoring Monday. Every single Monday, I don't care what day it is. If it's Christmas, I still do it. I try to help people find professional mentors. So if you want to give back to your industry and help someone new, or if you are brand new or you're looking to switch careers into InfoSec, this is the place for you. It's totally free. And basically, you can meet up with people on the internet talk to them and hopefully find eventually the right mentor for you. And the last resource is me. I am a nerd at large on the internet being dweeby. So I make videos, I make blog posts, I do all the things and I give talks. And so if you wanna follow me, that would be cool. I hang out on Twitter the most. And with that, I would like to thank you all for your time and attention. Today.